Bauer. Greetings. I am Walt Bauer and I'd like to welcome all of you to the Human Development Institute's second fall seminar. My brief visual description is I am a white male wearing glasses with hazel eyes and a blue and white pattern shirt. My pronouns are he, him, his. I'm sitting in front of a virtual background. My virtual background is a three-story brick academic building that houses the offices for the Human Development Institute on the University of Kentucky campus. The sun is shining on the brick building. We welcome all the participants who are joining us today. Our presenter will provide an opportunity for questions today, and we welcome questions from all of our participants. Please type your questions for our speaker in the Q&A box for a robust question and answer session. If you hover over the bottom of of your Zoom screen, you will see the Q&A option. Please use the chat box for technical questions. You are joining the webinar on mute. There is not a participant video in the webinar room. <clears throat> we have live captioning for the webinar and the closed captioning feature. Turn on the captioning by clicking on the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen and then clicking show subtitle. Should you have any questions about CEUs, you can contact me. My email address is walt.bauer at uky.edu. Again, my email address is walt.bauer at uky.edu. Please take a moment to complete our brief evaluation. You will receive an email that provides a link to access the session evaluation. It is really helpful as we plan for upcoming webinars. The title of the webinar is Disability and Stress During a Time of Unprecedented Stress. It's a pleasure and a privilege to introduce our speaker this afternoon. We have Dr. Robin Lewis Brown with us. Dr. Brown is a quantitative sociologist who specializes in the study of stress and health among women and people with disabilities. She has written extensively about differential responses to discrimination and collective trauma, including that associated with the Great Recession, the 9-11 attacks, and the COVID-19 pandemic. She has published more than 50 peer-reviewed articles and chapters on these topics and is currently supported by a Switzer Fellowship from Nidler to study disability-related discrimination and employment. She is an associate professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of Kentucky, where she also serves as the director of the Health, Society, and Populations Program. I'm now going to turn it over to Dr. Brown. The floor is yours, as they say. Thank you so much, Walt. I appreciate it. I appreciate that very nice introduction, um, laying out my uh, my background and research interests so clearly. To provide you all with a visual description, I am a white, middle-aged-ish, <laughs> middle-aged woman with short brown hair, and I am sitting in my campus office here in the Patterson Office Tower, so I have uh, several bookshelves behind me. The sun is also shining <laughs> here, and I just want to say before I get started how much I appreciate you all joining me on your Friday and um, to talk about uh, stress, no less, on, on a Friday afternoon. So I'm really excited to be here and to get to share uh, my uh, an area of work that's so interesting to me with all of you. And I'll look forward to your questions and to having a really robust discussion. The way that I would like to organize our time today is um, so following a brief overview of Kind of our goals for today, which I'll get to just in a minute. Um, I'll give you some background on the scientific study of stress and the development of that field. And then I'd like for us to, to pause for any questions that we might have on that material. And then from there, we'll move into talking about stress during, in the context of the pandemic or in a time of unprecedented stress, as the title promises. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and share my screen and provide you with the presentation. I know that um, some of you also have this handy on your screens at home. Okay, so again, let's see. We can, we can see the presentation. 
That's great. Good news. <laughs> Okay, and yes, and as uh, as Walt noted as well, the work that I'm going to talk about has been supported by a Switzer fellowship that I received uh, from 2021 to 2022. It just ended sadly, but um, I was really very fortunate to have that generous funding from my blurb. So first, as you may notice from the, actually I need to, I just realized I need to minimize my screen or else I'm not going to be able to see my slides as I would like to. Okay, so uh, there are four or really three and a half, uh, three uh, objectives for our seminar today. First, to discuss disability as a form of social inequality um, in the same way that we talk about gender, or race ethnicity as markers of social inequality, for example. And then to, to elaborate on that by considering cultural understandings of disability and ability. Second, uh, the second objective is to apply sociological and psychological theories to understanding disability-based differences in pandemic-related stressors and their mental health effects. And third is to identify current economic, political, and social challenges and needs for people with disabilities as are reflected in federal policies, programs, and resources. And to do this, um, as I just noted in discussing how I'd like us to spend our time today, I'll first give you a primer on the scientific study of stress. Then we'll discuss current research on pandemics related stressors and those that are disproportionately experienced by people with disabilities. And third, we will talk about and shift our focus to um, addressing unmet program and policy needs. So I, I'm aware that in uh, organizing a seminar on stress and health, there's, um, there's a certain difficulty that's inherent in this because I think unlike many academic subjects, we all know about stress very well. We know about stress in the context of our everyday lives and uh, we uh, would be hard pressed to spend a day without stress. And you know, I was when I was thinking about this today, I was remembering um, all the times when I've told people that I'm a stress researcher, and they say, "Oh, well, you're a stress researcher. You should study my life." <laughs> and which is, you know, <laughs> which is funny because we all do know about stress. But then I think hmm, my friend, who's a microbiologist, doesn't hear that very much, and of course, she also <laughs> studies bodies. Um, but so one of the things that's challenging in, in organizing this is that we all know about stress um, and the way that the the way that stress is studying studied scientifically is a little different. So I want to just note that up front and and then the way that that um, work has been applied is also sometimes somewhat problematic. And so here on this slide, I have the cover of the book, The Body Keeps the Score, which I've read it, maybe you've read it as well. Um, I think that in many ways, this uh, encapsulates what I'm talking about in terms of the, the challenges of, of doing this kind of research, because, uh, you know, like many other pop psychology topics, it's we all experience stress and um, we can take this, the science and um, apply it in a way very individually when the science itself is never meant to be applied individually. Um, so, you know, while the book um, suggests that your body is sitting with a, a little scorecard and uh, recording every <laughs> trauma and uh, acute event you experience, the, the reality isn't quite as straightforward as that. So you know, we have this idea that our body is keeping the score and that all the stress that we experience in our life uh, is affecting us. So in this seminar for today, I'd like to spend a little bit more time talking about, well, why do we think that this is so? Why do we think this? Why do we have this understanding of stress? What do we actually know about stress? And then um, in the final portion to briefly touch on what we might do with the knowledge that we have. So first to the question of, well, why do we think this? Why do we have this view of, um, of stress? 
And this is a really good example of the dangers of taking population level science and applying it to individuals. And the reality is that um, it's many kinds of topics that are studied at the population level are never meant to be studied among individuals. A uh, somewhat dramatic <laughs> example of this, which is one that we all know very well, is uh, the BMI. So um, I don't know if it would be possible to not know what the BMI is, but the body mass index. Some of you may know that the body mass index was something that was designed by a French economist uh, many, many, many years ago, and it was intended to reflect the ideal person at the time, the ideal French body. By the way, it didn't just include your height and your weight originally. The Quetelet Index originally included all kinds of other things like your involvement with the criminal justice system and whether you were married and how long you lived and how long your uh, other family lived. And so it included all of these other things and it was meant to be the ideal French man. And then uh, the uh, as part of that then, uh, because Quetelet was a population health scientist, he was interested in understanding variations from that norm. Okay, so this is this, this sort of strange science. And even Quetelet said, this is the ideal. There's, this is not supposed to be used for individuals. And yet we know <laughs> that the BMI has, first of all, maybe it's helpful to know that it, well, it's formation is a little problematic, but we know that it's applied to individuals all the time. And not just that, but that, um, we um, have diagnoses that are made based on what our BMI is. We are you know, placed into risk categories, uh, different categories of risk based on BMI and so on. So it's applied in a really individual way, despite the limits of the science. And one of the things that's important about this is that uh, a good deal of research suggests that BMI itself is actually not a great predictor of health outcomes. And I, so I'm including here a, a chart from a study that was conducted in 2014 by Latner and colleagues. And what it shows is that as people's weight is shifting, uh, people in the US population, um, as you see people's um, weight distributed from lower to higher BMI, there's really little effect of BMI itself, but what is a more significant predictor is um, the, the degree to which you internalize weight-based discrimination. So it's not so much BMI that matters for health, it's um, how BMI influences discrimination exposure, which therefore affects health. And I think that this is a really good example. First, I want to introduce it now because BMI is, as we're talking about stress, it can be a good counterexample to come back to again, again, and again. But also, I think, you know, fundamentally this idea that, you know, we think that we're told um, <coughs> at the doctor's office and, and um, in various other settings that BMI is an important predictor of health. And so just remembering that mm, sometimes it's not just BMI, but it's what BMI is a proxy for, or what BMI means socially. And, um, th and this is certainly a theme in social epidemiology, which is that as we get better about understanding health um, conditions, the social uh, circumstances that we live in become more rather than less important. So this is important because um, you know we're taking population health and applying it to an individual in a way that can have concerning consequences because it's not really intended for the individual. So with that caveat in mind, I really want to shift the focus from thinking about stress as something that is individually experienced and has to be individually addressed um, to thinking about this as um, something that we collectively experience and can collectively address. 
And I think this is really important too, because when we're, again, everybody experiences stress every day, all the time, just, you know, it's only one o'clock Eastern time now. And I know that we've all had something that stressed us out, it, it happened already. So, um, but the problem is when we focus on this as an individual issue, it can be very, very challenging to identify individual solutions. Whereas when we think about this collectively, then we move into being able to identify policies uh, and programs and social resources that can help to more effectively address uh, collectively experienced stress. So I hope that makes good sense. So, uh, so now I wanna move into talking about what do we know at the population level about stress and the effects of stress? I want to root this in, uh, in the history of stress research as a field in two different ways, which I think are interesting because you still see the influence of these early thinkers in many ways in the field today. So first, I'll start with our sociologist, who uh, Emil Durkheim, who is often referred to as the father of sociology and was the first to uh, take secondary data, analyze it, and then form theories based on that analysis. So in Emil Durkheim's uh, famous book, Suicide, he presents findings which show that suicide rates varied systematically uh, based on the social condition. So he's looking at uh, death statistics in France. And based on those statistics, finds differences in the social conditions um, which spurred suicide, people dying by suicide. And based on this, form these four different typologies of suicide uh, based on lacking social integration, uh, which, uh, which leads to an individual feeling alienated and feeling separated. This is referred to as egoistic suicide. So the second typology is based on not having a coherent meaning system uh, in one's life, which uh, is, was associated with anomic suicide or enemy. Uh, the third typology was experiencing con excessive constraints in one's life, which is found to associate with fatalistic suicide. And then fourth, over-identifying with a particular group's values or uh, causes, um, which was associated with altruistic suicide. And so this is, uh, was, was very influential and remains influential because it was the first, um, the, the first example of a scholar using population data to link social conditions with a health-related outcome. Okay. So then some time passed. So it, the suicide was written in 1897. And so then um, some time passed, but we can take a few key points from Durkheim's work. So first, it's important to emphasize that the methods that were being employed by Durkheim focus on social rather than individual sources of variation, which result in different group rates. So again, we're looking at population trends. We're not looking at individual experiences. And this, as I mentioned, was achieved by analyzing um, death statistics in France. And so based on this work, there are two uh, concepts that that remain influential. So first is the idea is noted that distress arises out of social roles and the differences in power and resources and autonomy they confer. That stress is really um, embedded in our social roles. And second, that it's not just whether or not you occupy a particular role but also the expectations that are associated for us in roles that can result in distress placed upon the body. And the idea is then is that mental distress, experiencing psychological distress or discomfort is formed through a combination of both what roles we occupy and what the expectations are for us in all of those roles. And so one of the examples that has long been given 
for this is that, um, and this is reflects some dated gender norms, but the idea that if there's are two people who are married, one's male, one's female, and one or the other is unemployed, that there are very different understandings of what it would mean to be married and unemployed. A woman would be more likely, again, dated, but a woman would be more likely to be referred to as a housewife under those conditions, and a man would be more likely to be called unemployed. Um, okay, so that would be an example, and perhaps you can think of other examples that are less dated and would, would be better examples. Okay, so then time passes, this is influential, um, both for early sociologists and those that are interested in understanding the form and meaning of health and illness, um, and also in the natural sciences and in the field of psychology and biology. So this brings us to Hans Selye, who, so we have the father of sociology first in Durkheim, and now we have well, who is often referred to as the father of stress research, Hans Selye, who is an endocrinologist who, and I say, and a rat torturer because he predominantly studied rats interested in the effects of different, um, uh, different poisons and different shocks to their system on the endocrine system. The way he found through his experiments with rat uh, is that subjecting them to injections of all different kinds of painful chemicals over a sustained period of time led to physiological changes um, in the rats that were also associated with the release of certain uh, hormones in, in their bodies. And then, you know, following first, there was the observation of hormones being released, then uh, the onset of the disease and then ultimately the death of the animal. But what was really uh, unexpected in cell use research is that it wasn't just the rats that were in the test or experimental um, group that were having these effects. In fact, all of the rats were experiencing this. And then so you quickly realize that, in fact, the great stress was the experience of interacting with him, essentially. You know, the findings held whether, um, whether for the test or the control group. So all of the rats, those that received a placebo, had the same effect that the rats who were in the test group received. That they all had this effect on their bodies um, which wasn't well explained. So Selye uh, borrowed from um, the field of engineering to uh, use the term stress to define this effect. Really thinking about the impact of what was happening to the bodies of the rats he studied, that the, 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 their bodies were being stressed. And uh, also then Selye observed that there wasn't necessarily one system or one bodily system that was affected by stress. Rather, the effects seemed to be nonspecific to different animals. And while nonspecific, it was profound that it was affecting multiple body systems. You know, conversely, we can say that, well, it's affecting all aspects of bodily function, mm -hmm. psychological function, and um, is having a, a really significant uh, effect on, on these animals. So from this, we can take a few key points, but I want to note something that's <laughs> kind of strange about this work that, um, that, is, that I think is important to note and hopefully will um, keep you very interested in this intellectual journey that stress research has, um, has continued on. So the first is this idea that stress is universally bad for your health, that there are lots of things that we experience as stressful in our lives and they're bad for our health. The second key point is understanding that stress um, affects different groups differently. And um, so we don't all have the same effect to stress. So I see that um, we have a hand raised here and I'm, I'm happy to, let's see, I'm happy to answer a question. 
Well, is this something it, you could help me with? I, I can help you with this. If you can certainly put the question in the Q&A box would be okay. one way to, and then we can we can get to the, we can address the question. If you'd like to put the question in the Q&A box or put it in the, put it in the Q&A box. If you hover your cursor at the bottom of the screen, the Q&A box will pop up and you can type your question right in there. We'll address that. Okay, terrific. Yeah, I think that what will work well is to kind of talk through a few key points and then I would be really happy to clear up questions and, and to elaborate on any points that mm -hmm. might be useful and then we can continue from there. Okay, so this first is that stress is universally bad. Second, stress affects us, but it it doesn't have a, a, a clear effect. It doesn't just affect one bodily system, in other words. And then the third thing, and this is what I find so interesting in this history, um, is that, well, it's stress, it's not smoking that's affecting your health or your body. And this was, in fact, um, the originally the the work that Selye and many other stress researchers were doing was funded by cigarette companies. And this was, you know, in, in the um, earlier or kind of mid 20th century where there was some concern that was beginning to emerge about the impact of smoking on the body that um, stress research um, and many of the early stress researchers were scientists who were employed by, uh, by cigarette companies to show that no, 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 the effect of stress is something completely different um, than the effects of nicotine. And in fact, as you can see in this ad, you know, <laughs> smoking might really be helpful for um, the effects of stress. So, you know, I was thinking about the, um, some of the advertising by Cymbalta and other um, medicines for mood disorders and, you know, this, you know, depression hurts, Cymbalta can help. And, you know, imagine if it was <laughs> depression hurts, uh, Marlboro can help <laughs> because essentially, you know, that's the way in which cigarette um, companies and manufacturers were using the, the science is to uh, promote cigarettes and also to address concerns that cigarettes were health harming. So that is fortunately not something that has stood the test of time. Uh, but these other ideas remain really, really, really influential and have led to uh, significant developments in the field of stress research, which has for a, a good deal of time been really completely separate from um, the tobacco industry. Okay, so now I'm covering a issue. Oh, here we go. Okay, so Selye then introduced uh, what is typically referred to as the biological stress model, which includes four different stages. So you have uh, the you have stressors or four different components. You have stressors. You have these conditioning factors different aspects of um, differences between people or rats um, that are going to affect how a stressor impacts the stress response. And so this is, I know, already really confusing. So there's this difference made in the literature between stressors and stress, where stressors are what you experience. Stressors are the death of a loved one going through a divorce, um, being in a car accident, witnessing a car accident, um, and so on. We'll talk in considerable more detail about stressors, um, that, that stressors are distinct from the experience that we have in the body because of these stressors. That's the impact on the body, the wear and tear of the body as we're experiencing these social conditions. And then this is thought to further lead to distress in the body, which is uh, the dysregulation of bodily systems. So this then is the, so we have stressors, conditioning factors, differences. This is why not everybody responds to getting a poor grade exactly the same, right? So these conditioning factors matter for how our um, organism re responds to stressors. I will say I use them interchangeably. 
um, we all do. <laughs> so um, mostly in this talk, I'm going to talk about stressors rather than the stress response. And when I do talk about the stress response, I typically use that term to, to be clear in that. And then, you know, what results, as I said, is this distress in the body. So this was the basic, uh, this is the basic model that Selye introduced. And I think, you know, now it's helpful to ask, well, what do we mean then when we talk about impairment conditions or what, how does disability relate to this? And it's important to note that for early researchers, the resulting uh, dysregulation in the body is really the only thinking about disability that was done. It's a really problematic way to think about um, having a disability, that it's just the thing to avoid like by focusing on these earlier mechanisms. It's really also not helpful for, uh, for looking at changes um, in stress experience and how that, how that can improve or worsen health. It's not helpful for driving policy and so on. So it's a really limited model, I think, in terms of its applications to people with disabilities. Um, so building then on that work, as we move into the more modern uh, face or era of stress research, uh, we've seen further development of, um, of understanding the stress process or the process through which stressors impact the body. And it's just important to note that this has been a highly interdisciplinary effort, including not just sociologists and psychologists, but also um, scholars from the fields of public health and medicine and other disciplines. So then moving into the more modern era from 1981 to the present, uh, it's, it's so interesting, I think, in revisiting this history that a sociologist and two psychologists introduced frameworks for stress research that are essentially identical in the same year in 1981. And these, uh, so Lazarus and Folkman and um, Leonard Perlin, whose model I'll talk about more and as a fellow sociologist, uh, made very similar suggestions in the models that they introduced, um, the stress process model and the stress and coping models. Uh, both of these models have four kind of fundamental points. And I will also talk these through uh, based on a conceptual diagram. But first, just to make the point. So the first point is that health altering events are not isolated, but they're embedded in social positions. This is where you very much see the influence of Durkheim coming through in further thinking about stress. Um, so thinking about the impact of roles and so on, that these are in, embedded in the roles we occupy, but also embedded in different statuses that we occupy. So this could mean, um, you know, both ascribed or achieved statuses being um, your race, your gender, you know, those would be ascribed statuses. And then um, thinking about achieved statuses, um, uh, aspects of ourselves, like our educational attainment, for example. Okay, so first, we have that they're not isolated. Second, uh, oh, ex excuse me, they're embedded in our social position. Second, that all of the stressors that we are experiencing are interconnected. They're not divorced from, from our broader experience, that they're not random. They're connected to the, the, the positions that people occupy. Or that um, stressors are diverse. We'll talk about this in more detail here in a minute, but they take many, many different forms um, that can be understood up, across a continuum. And fourth, that the impact of stressors or the impact of health altering events may be offset by intermediary functions, which are referred to typically as mediators. To, to borrow a statistical term. So then the way that we can think about this model um, is to consider that the statuses that we occupy 
the roles that we occupy and so on influence the kinds of social stressors we're exposed to. We think about differences from, you know, being in school to being in um, the to being in the work sector or being out of the work sector to being retired or transitioning uh, away from work, that all of those different contexts are associated with really different forms of stress, right? Okay, so that, so the, our, our, the context of our lives influences the kind of stressors we're um, exposed to. And these stressors in turn have an impact on health but it's not just a direct effect, rather there are all of these intermediary factors that influence the degree to which stressors are translated into uh, a, a health outcome. Okay. So um, when we think then about stressors, which is where I've spent most of my career thinking about stressors rather than the stress response, um, as, I, as I mentioned that um, stressors emphasize our position in social structures um, in thinking about things like our social class or ethnicity or gender and so on. They emphasize social roles and, uh, and they emphasize connectivity or the connection between different stressful experiences. One of the classic examples is given is that um, following, so a divorce is an acute hardship or acute event, but then it is often associated with other kinds of more chronic hardships like financial difficulties, changes in living situation, um, and so on. We can also then, you know, apply this to more macro level experiences like a pandemic, but I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, um, but this is what we mean by uh, stress proliferation or stress connectivity that the experience of many stressors begets additional stressors. Okay, so then taking these different um, kinds of uh, relationships, roles, and statuses into account, um, you know, we can think about how losing a social relationship is stressful. We can think about how being in a subordinate status at work, or in the community when we go to the store, that that is something that can be very stressful. And as well, we can consider how the failure to achieve certain desires is also very stressful. So then in thinking about how stress is embedded in the roles and the statuses that we occupy, then we um, come to these major categories of stressors, which include chronic, um, chronic stressors, chronic events, major traumas, these are life altering events, um, the kinds of daily hassles that are often, you know, they don't extend over time throughout the day. They're not, they, they are and they aren't chronic. It's something that's a, it's a hassle every day in your life, maybe at the same time. And then um, also consider uh, disasters, the experience of shared disasters. So then taking these different categories, I can place them on a continuum from those events that are most discreet, like experiencing a traumatic event. Think of this as like a car crash. This is something that happens, really can be very, very traumatic. And then, but it's just a discreet event. And then, you know, life change events are somewhat less, um, less discreet. And then we move into daily hassles. This can also include um, daily experiences of discrimination, for example, daily interpersonal slights. And then as we move into more continuous, we have as a category non-events, the things we wish, keep wishing would happen that aren't happening. And then at the most um, continuous chronic stressors, ongoing challenges that affect us over a period of time. Along with thinking about stressors along a continuum, we can also recognize that um, there's a certain dimensionality to stressfulness um, based as, um, on the, the level um, or based on where in the social stratum that 
their experience. So <laughs> this, the slide says level of social reality, and I feel like that's a really terrible term for actually what we're talking about, um, which is thinking more on from the individual, the most individual level to the most macro level. And so as an example, so a, an individual micro level experience would be something like the daily hassles that you experience um, in your day to day life. Also, maybe um, acute events that happen to you, something that happens to you. And then as we move into the meso level, then um, this is these are experiences happening in your family, happening in your school environment or your work environment. Uh, also in your neighborhood, and we can zoom out further still and think about um, macro level events like 9-11 or like the recession or like the pandemic. Um, and the point is that, you know, we can kind of zoom in and zoom out of our lives in this way, but also to recognize that what's happening at the macro level is influencing the micro level and the these experiences are both discrete and often um, sustained or continuous.